Good afternoon. Merry Christmas. The next time that we meet, Christmas will have come and gone. How about that? Can you believe that it is the end of 2023? We are entering into 2024, which is 60 years after 1964. This is my big 60 year coming up. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. However, um, I think I came with a quickie for you guys a couple of weeks ago, and this one's going to be kind of quick as well. There's been a lot going on. I'm not sure how many of you knew what happened to my dad, where they tried to amputate his leg. Seriously, that's a long story. That's a five-week story. But I am happy to say that he was on his stationary bike yesterday for 30 minutes. 30 minutes with both of his legs, mind you. Mm-hmm. So we're excited. We're super excited. That's all I want for Christmas. I've gotten what I wanted for Christmas is that my dad has both of his legs. So and he's doing well. He should be completely driving by the beginning of the year. He should probably be back fully, fully to his old self. I would say early spring, but right now he's getting around. It's less and less and less work. It has been so difficult for me and my two sisters caring for him. He is not the best patient, not at all, but we're happy. So today, um, last time I came because we had been away from each other for about a month and I kind of just wanted to get something going again to get back on track. I think we missed two video weeks. And I went through Mark 6, 7 through 13. And I remember saying I was actually going to try to come back last week and do a short one, but I just wanted to kind of re-emphasize what's happening in the last two scriptures, the last two verses of that section. And this is a section where Jesus had gone to Nazareth and he was rejected by his own people because they grew up with him. I mean, you know, it's different. Um, it's just like you and I, you know, when probably whatever your profession is, when I go places and I'm Dr. Dallas, a naturopathic doctor. You know, my friends just can't make themselves say that. They're just like, okay, Renette. And that's when you know the people that I actually grew up with. Because they'll call me by my first name, Renette. My new friends, my friends in the last 15, 20 years, don't even know my name is Renette. They just know me as Dallas, you know. So anyway, um, when you grow up with people, you kind of climb trees together or whatever. It's just kind of difficult for them to wrap your head around you being somebody of anything other than the little snotty-nosed person that was climbing a tree with them. And so that's probably what was going on when Jesus went home, and he talks about that, that, you know, the people in your own town can't appreciate you. So he went on to preach in other villages. And then this is also a turning point, because this is when he began to send out his 12. And he sent them out in pairs, and we talked about last week when he actually called the 12 to himself, his 12 disciples and apostles, if you want to call them that. But these last two uh, verses simply say, so they, the 12 that he selected, went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. I don't have my other translation, but the, the standard uh, American version uh, gives a better description here. And my phone is on, so I can't pull that right quick. So we'll go with this. But there's a great emphasis on them, the description in which went along with what the disciples were sent out to do. So I'm just going to repeat this and work with the words that we have here in the New King James Version. So they went out and preached that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Now, as we're here in the Advent season, you know, and we get into our red, <laughs> that's why I have a red shirt on today, our red flowers and the whole Christmas scene, our Christmas trees and our decorations and 
the nativity scenes here and there and you know how we do it. And then you run into people that don't know who Jesus is. They've never heard the gospel there. They, some have not been in churches outside of funerals, etc. And they are a part of the celebrations, but what are they celebrating? And that's not as sad as the sad commentary of we that are Christians that have friends and people that are invited to our gatherings in our homes or other things that we do to celebrate the holiday, um, leave our presence or the event and still not know the reason for the season. <laughs> and sometimes um, it's difficult for some Christians to articulate that because they don't have a good foundation of what this is all about. And that's because also you can find yourself going to a church every Sunday and the gospel is just not being preached. And what is the gospel and, and who decides whether or not the gospel is being preached or not? And so this is why I love these two scriptures. This is why I wanted to just spend a moment just emphasizing some simple points and the simplicity is an extension of what we talked about last week when it, we talked about, or two weeks ago, we talked about him sending out the 12 when he specifically told them how they're to go out in terms of their dress, which articles of clothing that were standard articles of clothing for rabbis at that time, for individuals living in that area, what they should take and what they shouldn't take. You know, and we summed it all up saying that Jesus is about simplicity and, and he wanted them to go out and be simple men. And now he's saying, this is what you're going out to do. So uh, you're going to get the, the hint of the, the, the inscription that I left there in a moment. So first and foremost, he says, so they went out and preached that people should repent. And so last week we talked, two weeks ago, we talked about them being sent out to herald. They're heralders. And what were they heralding? Heralding that actual definition means a proclamation. And that's very important here because they didn't go out preaching something that they came up with. They didn't go out preaching their opinion. They didn't go out preaching something uh, popular. They simply went out and proclaimed the message. And what is the message? The message that Jesus sent them out to proclaim, the messenger's proclamation was repent. Repent of that thing that you are doing so that you may be saved. Nothing else, just that was the message. And the first time we hear of this is in John, uh, when Jesus first, did, as soon as he came out, uh, John the Baptist was put in prison shortly after Jesus did his 40 days in the desert. And then Jesus came, comes on the scene. The very first thing that he starts to say is repent. And so Jesus sent them out. So they're going out. They're using their own mouths, but they are using their mouths to translate, to proclaim the message from the messenger. Nothing else is added to that. You know, the charisma, all the other stuff that we have today, as long as the simple message is coming through, that's fine. And sometimes it gets caught up in that. It gets lost in that, I should say. And so there's a clear directive here that they were out and they preached repent. They went out to proclaim Jesus' message to repent. And then let's just talk about that for a moment because we get very sentimental about repentance. What does repentance mean? You know, when people say they're going to repent, there's an old story that um, I read in, in a commentary someplace where an uh, individual really liked from a distance this woman, a uh, girl that was a Christian. And she would have absolutely nothing to do with him because he was not a Christian. And so unbeknownst to her, he follows her to one of her Christian Bible study classes. And he sneaks in the back of the church and he's listening to what's taking place from afar. 
And the story goes that based on his understanding of what he was hearing, because luckily for him, this particular church was preaching what they ought to be preaching, and that's the simple gospel message. And the simple gospel message is that we are to repent so that we can put ourselves in a position to begin to accept Christ and believe and understand him as he is the son of God. Trust and follow and obey him. And he says, based on what he was hearing, it was like he would have to take all of his beliefs, his understandings, his habits, uh, his character, and, and heap it onto a pile of burning coals and start afresh in order to be that Christian disciple in order to have a relationship with this girl. That's pretty deep. It's deep in two aspects. It's deep is that he understood what was being taught, the real meaning and the real understanding of repentance. Repentance is here, and to repent is to do that 360-degree turn, the whole of me. I didn't just flip my hands. I didn't just flip my head. I just didn't flip, twist halfway, but it was a full turnaround of all that I am the inclusivity of me, what I embody, what's in my mind, what's in my thoughts, etc. And that is what real repentance is. And too often when we speak on repentance, we make people think that they're going to be better at something. They're going to do something a little better. You know, I might eat two carrots, but I'm going to start eating six carrots, you know, or it's just something where you just kind of switch up. What, and, and that's based on me already eating carrots on a regular basis versus somebody that never eats carrots and now you're going to eat 15 carrots every day. But it's making people think that it's just going to be a little better. And that's not what repentance is. Sure, we strive to be better at what we do and, and to use today's mistakes and temptations as stepping stones to be a better person next day. But repentance is that transformation of the mind that I am going to start to do things differently differently completely differently that's what repentance is it's 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 it's, it's, it's the people that that don't want to be disturbed you know we talk now about you know now as we're getting into the playoff season you know all men have what they call how did they come up with that name their little man cave you know when you really think, I was thinking about that this morning, I was like, you know, what is the, the whole point of Yeah, it's this place where you have all your things, but more importantly, when you think about a cave, you think about where you are kind of shielding yourself from environmental elements, you know, weather, yeah, one, but more importantly, beast, you know? And so you're shielding, you're, you're in this cave because you don't want to be disturbed. And most of us, if we could hang a sign that says, do not disturb, this gentleman felt like I have to put my, my habits and my character and my thoughts on a heaping thing of, 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 of uh, coal. But often when even the word repentance comes up in general conversations, people feel like, if they're not out here killing somebody, if they're not out here robbing a bank, then they really don't have anything to repent of. And anything short of that is just, I need to change my behavior a little bit. But for that person that doesn't want to be disturbed, you know, going into my man cave, don't bother me, don't call me, don't knock on the door, etc. That's the person that is that self-centered, selfish person in life that doesn't want to be bothered with the godly things that says, love thy neighbor, do for thy neighbor. You know, that other piece of the Christian life. You know, it's just as bad as the person that doesn't want to stop stealing and killing and, and, and all those other things. So it's the same thing. And so repentance is the same thing. It's that taking that which you are and turning it around so that it looks like a child following God and trying to be the mind of God, the heart of God, the hands of God, etc. And that is what repentance is. And most people don't want to be bothered with that. 
don't disturb what I'm doing. I go to church on Sundays. I don't want to go to church on Sundays and be a part of everything during the week. I put in money. I tithe. I give to the poor. I do good. I'm a good citizen. I don't want to do anything. People don't want to change who they are. They don't want to be, they don't want their little life disturbed from the things that they have grown to do on a habitual basis, you know? And that's kind of, that's what we really are dealing with today. And that's the hindrance of us moving forward as a church and making a difference in the community where other people will see that we have been transformed by our minds. We just, there's certain things we don't do and there are certain things that we do do. You know, we do, you know, I'm reading the Christian Manifesto where Alistair Begg is focusing on the Sermon on the Mount in its simplest form. What did Jesus really mean by the Sermon on the Mount? It's a really deep book. It's a small book. It's deep in the understanding of that. Love thy neighbor. You know, after he talks about blessed are the poor, blessed are those who are unpopular, blessed are those that mourn. Who wants to do that? You want to be popular. You know, you want to be wealthy. You want to be all the things that Jesus says are not the people that are blessed. And we don't really want to talk about that or think about that because anything that we're doing that doesn't allow us to be the poor and the unpopular and the mistreated, you know, the persecuted, is something that is putting us outside of who we are supposed to be. And then you move into that whole love thy neighbor. I mean, love the enemy, you know, those that curse you and those that, that hate you, bless them and pray for them. You know, it's it's the opposite. So the, that whole thing that he's teaching in the book is that Jesus is turning us upside down so that we seriously are countercultural. We are totally different from what the world is doing and what is popular for the world. And we're nowhere near that. We're trying to be like everybody else and everything that we do. And that's a problem. And so this piece here, these two scriptures, this is what this is talking about. Jesus is bringing it back from what was required then of those that he sent out, his disciples is required in the 21st century of us. And that is that we go out and we give the message, the message that we must repent. We must truly have a mind transformed to be able to do what God wants us to do and to be who we have been created to be, which looks different than those that are around us. And that's difficult, but that is what we are to be doing. And then he says, this is the lovely, lovely, lovely piece about it. So that's the message. But don't you love God that brings the message is the same God that brings mercy. And so it says, and they go out and they preach to repent the message. And that's together. That's apples and pears. That's garlic and onions and oranges and lemons do you know it's that thing that's ice cream and cake and it's hamburgers and hot dogs it goes together as a conjunction so just as just as important as the message of repentance is is also the mercy to be able to go out and cast out the demonic spirits to anoint people with oil that they may be healed from their sickness that is the mercy of God that, yes, I'm going to give you the message, but I'm also going to give you the mercy to heal you. I'm not only going to lift you out of your moral decay, but I'm going to lift you out of your physical pain and mental pain. And that's the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of our Savior that came to save us is that we may be restored holistically mentally, spiritually, and physically. And this happens simultaneously. I tell people all the time that Jesus started, the, the day that he began to preach in the synagogue was the day that he also healed in the synagogue. The healing, the physical, and the spiritual go hand in hand with God. And that's the m and that I said. I said, this is the one time that m ms are good for you. M for the message and M for the mercy. And that's what you always have to remember as we're moving through and we're telling people what Advent season is all about. It is because Advent means that we were sinners. And what he did, his life, his resurrection, his death and resurrection was such that you and I who are sinners who were separated from God may be restored 
That is the beauty of the season. That is the beauty that we tell the stranger, the person that's not knowledgeable of God. That is the reason for the season. And that is the beauty of these two scriptures that talks about what this is all about. It's the message, yes, that you must repent so that you may have the eternal gift of everlasting life. And two, that you may be healed physically of whatever it is that is keeping you from being the best that you can be. In the eyes of God and that's beautiful that's really beautiful because he there's obviously if it's a message to repent it's because we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing but yet right on the hills of that comes your blessing and healing and the only other thing that I want to talk about here is that it says that they're casting out many demons that thing that takes over you that demonic spirit but also how it says an anointed with oil many who were sick and healed. And I just want to mention that because for those of you who've never joined us and you're wondering why I'm in a kitchen, because that's what it's all about. That's the M&M. &M. That's the mercy, the message and the mercy. That is, yes, I come and I speak for 15, 20 minutes about how we get that to that point of repentance, what that means, what the message is, what the gospel of Mark is teaching us in terms of how to be disciples. But then there's this piece. It's the it's the, the, the piece that's going to heal your body, you know, because that was important to Jesus. And so that says that they anointed with oil. Why oil? And back during that particular time, you know, the Greek uh, doctor Galen, who was very instrumental in starting the holistic naturopathic movement, believed that oils were more instrumental in healing than anything else. And so if you ever visit our website, lifebydallas.com, you'll see that we have the Life by Dallas essential oil blends. And that's because that is something that has never changed. And I tell people that essential oils, especially when you can combine a variety of them, they work just amazing on the human body. And I really am just kind of grateful that this comes up today because in the healing of my father, you know, we had a couple of acupuncture sessions done, but then there was the daily massaging, you know, every two to three hours I was doing treatments on him with my favorite essential oil blend, Simply Wisdom, that I give to most of my clients. And typically I tell them, rub it in on your hands, inhale it, cup your hands and inhale it, and rub it on the balls of your feet. And so I have actually been bringing the circulation that the doctor told me was irreversible. Then he clearly stood there and said, if you take your father out of this hospital today, he will not live through the night. And if he so happens to make it through the night, the pain will be so excruciating that he will be out of here by tomorrow night. And bearing some type of miracle, at best, I would give him three days to live. Of course, that was almost six weeks ago. And he still has both of his legs and he obviously is alive but the oils and then i put the oils in the diffusers and i massaged his back with it and then i've done some oxyboxing treatments and just you know so it's been a variety of things but the oils have been an essential part of it and um the bible teaches us that you know they were anointed with oil to heal those that were sick Another thing that really helps us with sickness are raw juices. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this today is because we are moving into a holiday season. You know, I was at the tennis court earlier today. I had been at the, the, the veteran tennis play in six weeks. It was so nice to be missed like that. When I came, everybody's like, Dr. Dallas, where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you been? And so the two instructors were like, yeah, every week. Where's the house? Where's the house? Hands down. So here I am, I'm back, and I had to really stretch to get back today. But, um, you know, they had chocolate kisses, you know, and they'll have some cupcakes the next week. And it's just these things, you can't help it. Wherever you go, somebody's got some stuff that, you know, it's the same old bad stuff, but they put it in red and silver and green paper, and it's, it's Christmas stuff now, Christmas bad stuff. 
and you know, you just being social, you may have one or two chocolate kissies that you never ever eat, but you just have them because everybody else is <laughs> not grabbing the tennis balls, but grabbing chocolate kissies. And so when you're doing these things and they start to add up, they start to add up, you know, we are going to be looking to do something, you know, drastic in January. So when we know that we're in this season, you know, it's just the whole, you know, just kind of management in life. You know, you know that you're, you're, you're going to take extra money out of the bank. So, you know, you've been, you put away for a Christmas. I guess people remember you put away for a Christmas one, just put a few dollars away every month for Christmas. And now when Christmas comes, you've got all those dollars that have added up. So now you kind of put away some good stuff for the extra turkey, the, you know, Christmas and Thanksgiving are so close together, you could easily gain 50 pounds during the season. All the holiday parties that you have to go to and things like that. So juicing is very good because it's concentrated nutrients, one. It helps to kind of flush out the system, two. You know, all that stuff that you're accumulating, all those chocolate kisses and stuff, this creates that extra 32 pounds of undigested matter that has to be removed from the average American by the mortician. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the kind of stuff that, you know, creates that. And so when you're doing juicing, it's an easy way to just kind of counterbalance things, you know, and not really, but it's helpful. So that's what we're going to do. And it's easy. Sometimes I think people think juicing, ah, oh, it's just so hard. It takes so long. And so I want to make me some raw bread and some carrot uh, burgers. So I need some carrot pulp. So I said, you know what? It's good when I have to do uh, this for you guys because I can knock out uh, two birds with one stone. So I just sometimes I kind of have things already done and you can kind of catch on to it. But so I decided I'm just going to show you just how quickly and easy it can be done by having it really not ready, but doing it all at one time for you. So we have some carrots that we're going to do carrot juice. We can do plain carrot juice. My absolute favorite is carrot with ginger and apple, carrot, apple, ginger juice. Um, depending on what type of sickness you're trying to treat. There's no real juice that's better than any other one. I mean, to be perfectly honest, all raw juices are good. Um, you can target some things based on the color content. Uh, when you're dealing with the kidneys, you obviously absolutely want some kidney, uh, some kidney juice, some beet juice. See how you kind of simplify how you do this. You want to cut the tops and bottoms, just a, a, a couple of, um, centimeter or so off of the end. So you just grab four or five carrots at one time and then you just kind of remove some of this and sit them over to the side. Uh, and then we're going to string them all through at the same time. Um, but carrots have amazing healing properties. When you think about trying to get various foods in the body, you want to get, on a regular basis, a variety of colors in your diet every day, if possible, every color of food. And when you start doing that, you'll find that you're going to need twice as many orange foods, um, which are very good at developing the beta carotene, um, but it requires a little more. So for Every yellow food that you need as a natural laxative, you're going to need two orange foods as the, what I call skin cleansers, um, loaded with vitamin A and lots of stuff like that. So we're going to do some carrots. And again, um, you can do plain carrot juice. I would always put a tad bit of lemon as a natural preservative in most of your juices but definitely in the carrot juice because carrot juice can go rancid very quickly. Now the thing about carrot juice is this is five pounds of carrots. I have another five pound bag, but I'm not gonna bore you guys um, doing both of them. But one five pound bag of carrots is not going to net you like watermelon juice. Watermelon is 97% water, so you're gonna get a lot of water. Now look how hard these carrots are. That tells you right there that you're not going to get like globs of carrot juice from carrots. Um, and typically when I do carrots, I'm usually doing at least 10 pounds, two five pound bags. 
And that's because I'm always trying to make some carrot burgers, some carrot bread. So I use um, my pulp. Um, that's kind of discouraging for people that aren't accustomed to juicing because you feel like you got five pounds of carrots. And you're going to end up getting <laughs> 25 ounces of juice and a whole big sack of carrot pulp. That's the difference between carrot, uh, between juicing and blending. Typically for most of my juices, I will use the blender. Uh, whether you have a powerful blender or not, you just want to um, take advantage of the fiber. So when you're juicing, you're actually extracting the liquid from the fiber. And when you're blending, all of that remains there. Drink everything, because everything you started out with gets blended, and you're really not going to strain anything. You just kind of swallow it down. With the juicing, not only are you masticating it so that you are extracting the juice from the fiber, but then you end up straining it. And so you just get not a whole lot, but... A lot of times, too, depending on what you're using, these obviously are organic carrots, organic apples, organic ginger. When you're using, you know, and then you, when you have, you want to buy organic also um, because these are roots. And so when you do the carrot tops, if there's some pesticides or something that goes on the tops and it's going to mitigate down to the, the root vegetable as well. And then with carrots, you want to be able to take advantage of the soils that the carrots are growing in beneath the soil. And so when it's organic, you don't have to like clean them with a scrub brush. You want to kind of leave those nutrients from the soil intact, which is why you want to make sure that they're organic so that the soils aren't being treated with a bunch of chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know, the difference in organic carrots, organic apples, and so the prices aren't huge anymore. And so then you also, well, this is a, oh my God, uh, Burrell. I forgot the name of my juice. So I could literally, since this is an organic apple, I could stick the whole apple in here, but kind of might sort of want to remove the seeds. Um, you don't have to, but you can. But it's good to have a blender that has a large throat like that so that if I didn't have time to just cut this four times right quick, um, you could just throw it in here. And so we want it to be as smooth as possible. So we're going to just knock out the debris. Great for composting. So I'm going to go with just three apples here. We've got about five pounds of carrots. And so just relatively speaking in terms of the ratio that you want to use. Oh, every time I hear a helicopter or a plane, I'm just like, my flight instructor quit. And I'm just like, oh God, what else could go wrong this year? I really was trying to get my light. I'm quick. I'm there almost. I think I have... 26, 28 hours in. Still haven't done my solo, but she told me the last time I flew with her before she left, she says, what that was? That was the best landing that you've ever done. So, and that's because I had finally started reading my coursework and paying attention or focused, I should say. So I'm thinking I'm going to switch schools and find a new flight instructor and a new school. Oh, this sucks that I have to do that, but it's all good. I wouldn't have been able to do a whole lot of flying in the last six weeks anyway. Um, what's been going on with my dad? Man, that caretaker stuff. Woo! That's all I can say. So that's it. So that may have taken 10 minutes because I was chatty chatty. And so that's just to let you know, sometimes I might get off the treadmill in the morning on my way from working out to getting in the shower, decide I'm going to do a batch of carrot juice. And so that's going to be 15, 20 minutes. So that was the hardest part, rinsing the vegetables and chopping them.
your strain is not a whole bunch of any it's the bottom little fluffy part here and we'll simply just pour that out so that we can finish these last couple carrots put our apples and our ginger in we'll let that sit there medicinal properties associated for the um, gastrointestinal system but that's going to be totally up to you you know ginger has a little bit of kick to it a whole lot of kick to it so depending on how much you think you want in yours then you'll have to just kind of play around with it if it's your first time juicing so like I was saying that can be I think I might lose some of you. I don't know. I, I like I said, I lost my video. A <laughs> person just kind of like clocked out there. Um, so next year, I'm thinking if I get really organized, that a lot of times I'm very spontaneous with this. It depends on what's in the refrigerator, what I might feel like eating later that day or the next day. Um, but there will be a little thought maybe given to it. And then that way I can um, put you guys on an email list and give you the ingredients ahead of time so that you can go to the store and get the ingredients and then we can prepare things together. How about that? How cool would that be? And so you, I didn't want to use these lemons. Um, but you're gonna have a lemon or two. I like Myers, so I got some Myers, and I already had some Myers. And so for this amount, you know, you just wanna put a tad bit of lemon in as a natural preservative. And I say for this amount because this is not a lot. And typically you wanna consume 16, 32 ounces of raw juice a day, if possible. And so if you can pretty much knock that out in a day this is 32 ounces then you know you don't need a preservative for longer than a day or so i mean if you just had the carrot juice and you didn't use the lemon juice as a preservative your juice will probably be fine for 24 hours 24 48 hours but just in case you don't get to it which is not going to be the case for me especially with apple and ginger in there because i will be looking forward to drinking that and so five pounds of carrots Three apples and a few pieces of ginger is going to net you 48 ounces, 16 ounces, and 32 ounces of raw carrot juice, raw carrot apple ginger juice. So good. And of course, you can just drink it like that. Perfect combination. Not too spicy. Sometimes your carrots can feel a little gritty not because of how much you clean them, but just because of how they were harvested. Um, those are pretty good. Sometimes though, they're not as smooth. That's a pretty smooth batch. Can't really remember where I got those from. But if you can get them from the Amish market or a couple of local gardens, uh, uh, we have Echo City Farms here in our town. Um, that's a very pretty orange uh, carrot. And so, Sometimes you get them and they're just 
it tastes like not good. So that's that. And that's, this is, talk about healing in a glass jar and, uh, you know, and, and the larger batches I put in the glass jar. So something like this, I'll probably carry it with me to my dad's tonight. Um, but that's going to really help heal the body. Um, so that's a good way. Of course, you can do, that's one of the few things I use the juicer for. Most of the times I'm using my blender, mixed um, distilled water with apples or pears or watermelon or pineapple. I have a beautiful pineapple I picked up yesterday. I'm looking forward to making some pineapple ginger honey juice, um, probably on Monday or so after the pineapple ripens because it's bright, pretty green and you want it to get very, very soft where you can pull the top pieces out without a struggle and that tells you it's pretty ripe. It's going to look like it needs to be thrown out, but that's almost when it's perfect. And so then we have the carrot pulp here. You can just pull out the apple and ginger from the top and then I'll have probably close to three and a half pounds of carrot pulp. That's going to make me at least a dozen, two dozen carrot burgers and a couple of slices, you know, 18 by 18 pieces of carrot bread. I'll have to mix that with the ingredients that I need for both of them. And that will be something that we can do a heads up on. If I do the carrot juice one day, maybe we'll come back a special video two days later and within two days. Um, that's about as long as you want to keep the carrot pulp without using it. And we'll make some raw stuff. There's lots of raw things that you can make with the carrot pulp. So remember when M&Ms are good for you, it's when we're disseminating the message of repentance. And it's when we're being merciful to our fellow man. And hopefully we're teaching them how to heal themselves of their physical ailments and sickness and disease, but uh, more importantly that we're being merciful to them, just loving them as we would love ourselves. So Merry Christmas, and we will see you going into the new year. Take care.